welcome to the Imaginaries. The Imaginaries podcast, where we talk about books, movies, and other things of a science fictional nature that we're very excited about and interested in talking about for about 45 minutes. So, yep. here we are in the studio of mm-hmm. our famous executive, Tony Colella, um, and we're going to talk today not about one specific book or one specific movie, but books that we think made good movies or terrible movies mm-hmm. or would make for interesting cinema. Mm-hmm. So do you want to lead us off with your first book to discuss today? Yeah. So, well, before I do that, I want to say more generally, we're really thinking about the cinematic here. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about about a dozen books that span from, I want to say, oh, how far back do we go here? Maybe the 60s. <coughs> we're, not, we're not going back into, like, Golden Age sci-fi. Um, Although we do love Golden Age sci-fi. Yes, we're just not going to do it right now. It has, by and large, been um, adapted when it will be adapted. Yeah, well, the 70s. Okay, so we're going from, like, the late 70s up through today. Mm-hmm. Um, and we want to think about what cinematic means mm. in to, to us today, thinking about these books, because... It would be a completely different project to think about, you know, in the late 70s and reading Hitchhiker's Guide, what cinematic meant at that point. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it meant at that point. Mm -hmm. I can't put myself in that particular temporal context. But what I can think about is, if I read the Hitchhiker's Guide today, will that feel cinematic in a way that, you know, something that is contemporary may not? And... Basically, what we're thinking about today is whether it's on the big screen or the small screen, and whether it's on network television or premium television or a service like Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or whatever, you know, what sorts of books are being written that have an eye on adaptation Mm. in some sort of cinematic form. The reason why we were thinking about this specifically is, if you remember from our last podcast, which... Um, was probably good, and also... <laughs> it was so long ago. It was congested, <laughs> which you probably recognize, and recognize again today, because we so are congested. We're so congested. Um, but we talked about Ian McDonald's novel, Luna New Moon. And one of the things that we didn't get to talk about, but that Kendra and I were talking about Is the fact before, that this is not a new entry in the Twilight series. Yes. <laughs> Important thing to note. <laughs> Definitely not part of Twilight. <laughs> Luna, New Moon. No colon involved on the cover. Possibly one if it's being cataloged or added into library information systems. We'll, we'll find out. But author is Ian McDonald. What were you really going to say? What I was really going to say is that when we were talking about this book prior to recording the podcast, one of the things that I noted as just a, a kind of a neutral thing, it's this book is very disjunctive in the way that it jumps around. You get a lot of characters, you get a lot of scenes, you get a lot of action, you get a lot of, like, it doesn't sit still is one of the takeaways I have from this book. It does a lot and it does it very quickly and it makes it fun to continue to read. Kendra used the term momentum when we were recording the last podcast to describe what this book does well, and I agree. But to me, that momentum, that jumping through a lot of characters, jumping through a lot of scenes, showing a lot of action, is something that is very cinematic now. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily emblematic Mm -hmm. of cinematic, (laughs) but this book could be very easily adapted as a TV show in the current format. You know, 10 to 12 episodes, about an hour per episode, a lot of characters, a lot of jumping Mm -hmm. around, a lot of world building, Um, and it would... It could be successfully done. So, and, and my, my relationship to that was one that is kind of, I, I said neutral, it's not quite neutral, I have feelings about it, but <laughs> when I read a book, I don't want to feel like I'm reading a well-written Wikipedia article for a television series. I want to feel like I'm immersed mm-hmm. in a book, like mm-hmm. what I'm reading is necessarily a novel, not that it's another Form it's not pretending. a scaffold for something else better to follow. Right, right. And I don't want to imply that this book was that, but there are certain books and series that I feel like are coming out where the writing is not at the front, the character development is not at the front, the plot is not at the front, nothing's really at the front. It's just sort of this pretty sketch of what could be a television series, and that sort of writing may be a lot easier to accomplish. So let's name names. Are we thinking or are we not thinking about the James S.A. Corey series 
Leviathan Awakes and the rest of the Expanse series. I was thinking specifically of Game of Thrones, mm. but... But that's fantasy. If yeah, we were to translate right. this to sci-fi, that's we're true. to narrow right. our gaze a little yes, bit. Yes, yes. Then I would say The Expanse totally counts, because before we do a podcast that specifically talks about The Expanse, I want to revisit the novels, because I think that I, I had the same potential problem that I had with this book in that the chunks in which I was reading were too small to really get a, a full sense of the, the momentum in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the experience I had with that book, with that book series, is that the books themselves were not very good. I couldn't get into the characters. I didn't really follow them. I didn't really care about anything. It seemed overly complicated and like a good a good roadmap for a series. And then I, when I watched the series, I really fell in love with it. And I really mm -hmm. liked the world mm -hmm. and I liked the characters and I liked Kudos, what was going on. Yeah. Um, but the book, I was not really impressed with. So We're speaking specifically of the first century in the series. Right? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think I would agree with everything that you've said. In, in part because um, I do feel like Leviathan Wakes, I believe that's the name of the first book. I think so. Um, was written with an eye for adaptation, like a lot of books today. And I think that without naming names to call them out on the carpet and make fun of them, I think a lot of YA books are written with an eye for adaptation. Are they cinematic in that will they translate to cinema? Not are they cinematic in scope and in the way that their descriptive passages convey image to the reader. You know, I think that what we're seeing right now is a divergence in what the word cinematic means. Yes. Are we talking about the, the, the word in its in its corporate sense, like, is this going to earn money for us by being a, a, an adaptable book? Yes. Or is this a book that is cinematic in that it really, it's imagistic. Mm -hmm. It conveys all the things that a film would mm -hmm. through its prose. Yes. And I think that that, for me, is um, the true heart of the cinematic book. Yes. And that's what we didn't see in The Expanse. Yes. Which is cinematic in that it adapts beautifully oh, to yeah. the screen yes. and putting James S.A. Corey or at least one of the two authors who call themselves James S.A. Corey in the writer's room of the show was a really smart idea. Mm -hmm. It had the coherence of, of a book. Yes. But it also had the visual coherence that the book itself lacked. Yes. Yes. I agree. So let's talk about a few of our other books that we have. We have massive piles of books surrounding us we right do. now. We do. Massive piles because yes. Tony and I both accrue books at an alarming rate. <laughs> um, and we wanted to talk about some books that have been adapted, some books that possibly should be adapted or are personal favorites <laughs> for any reason really. <laughs> uh -huh. But we wanted to talk about books that are cinematic by yes. nature and books that have been adapted and whether they are cinematic according yes. to our terminology or not. Yes. So, yes. Um, I'm going to start off actually with a pair of books, both of which were published originally in 1974, mm -hmm. neither of which has been adapted into a movie um, or a TV show or anything on any sort of screen. The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin and The Forever War by Joel Haldeman. I love The Dispossessed so much. <laughs> I, yes, I, I chose these <laughs> books because I, I love both of them a whole lot. And they're both of a time. <laughs> both of these books I read for the first time within the past five years. Oh, they're so good. Um, they are so good. But, like, <gasps> reading them in, you know, reading them post-2010 uh -huh. is a really different reading than reading them post-Vietnam War. Like, mm -hmm. immediately post-Vietnam mm -hmm. War mm -hmm. for the Forever War. <coughs> or, you know, thinking about the social, political, cultural mm -hmm. context in which they were written and then immediately read. But what, the reason I wanted to choose both of these is that even though they are from the same year, were published in the same year, they're doing very different things. The Dispossessed is a much quieter, more personal book. A lot of it is, in, in terms of the scenes that we get, dialogues or small scenes between a couple of different characters, two, three, four, with some notable exceptions. But I, I chose this specifically because... The first time I ever came to the, to the Dispossessed, I didn't read it. I was on a long road trip, and I had what I thought was an audiobook copy of The Dispossessed. Mm -hmm. What I actually had was an audio play of The Dispossessed. Goodness! Which was different, but not super different. Like, you know, all of the That's same so moments crazy. were there. But it was interesting that my first exposure to this book was in this format that necessarily was all dialogue. So there, what, there could be no prosaic 
elegiac description in the way that Ursula Le Guin does it in the book, mm-hmm. because everything had to be from the mouth of a character. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and then coming to the book, again, the story was not all that different. There were some scenes that had been exploded in the audio play that were not in the book, but more or less the same thing. Um, again, pretty quiet, pretty personal. Mm-hmm. The Forever War, on the other hand, is also intensely personal, but isn't necessarily action-driven, in that it covers a war that spans thousands of years and is on a whole lot of different locations, like from the Black Rocks at the beginning getting to multiple different visions of Earth, like, again, thousands of years apart, to a a far, far, far problematic for today future (laughs) where all the characters are gay, and it's basically like Utopia, where I I forget it. Is that what we think that the future is? Like, the future is just gayer than we are? My fingers are crossed. I mean, (laughs) everyone's fingers are crossed who's in in, in our particular alphabet soup. Yes, yes, agreed. So the reason, before before you say anything, the reason why I chose these two um, in in combination is that neither of them has been adapted. They're, you know, they're of a time, their own Mm -hmm. place. And they could have been easily. The Dispossessed is a movie that would have worked probably... Um, And I'm thinking here of, like, going into the 80s even, so, like, the 10 years after it was published, in that climate when Sigourney Weaver got nominated for Best Actress for the role she had in Aliens. You know, science fiction was potentially getting more respect as something that could make movies that not only made money, but also could be respected dramatically, could be respected for not just the big summer blockbuster, but what was going on. The writing, the directing, the cinematography, the acting, whatever you wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And so it could be like, you know, a thoughtful little little piece that had a lot of great acting in it. Whereas The Forever War could have been adapted into this big, again, personal, in that we would have had a a couple of starring folks who headlined this movie, or, or potential television series, but, you know, included a lot of action, including a lot of shooting and a lot of, fisticuffs in space and and battles between ships and (laughs) battles between people on planets and like it would have been very exciting and we saw neither of those even though I think that I would describe both of these books as cinematic in different ways through a particularly privileged lens of looking back and seeing like how things unfolded over the past 30 years or so but the fact that we see neither of these books Ad- adapted in, in any way is kind of telling to me. So mm-hmm. I want to start our discussion there with some books from 1974 mm-hmm. that have, you know, continued to be relevant, but that did not get adaptations, either then or now. And the caveat I want to throw out there, final thing I will say before I turn it over to Kendra, sorry, I know you're, you want to say something now, but the final caveat there is that I don't want the Dispossessed adapted at this point. I don't want the Forever War adapted at this point. Uh, these are books that can be can be enjoyed, can be appreciated, can be uh, taken out of their particular temporal context and still, you know, you can still like them today. Well, and I think that they're both cinematic in the sense that they evoke all that they need to yes. in a written form. Yes. And this is probably going to be a central tension when we talk about a lot of stuff today, is that I don't know that you could make a movie <coughs> outside of the temporal context in which these books were written. And I'm thinking of several movies that have recently failed that have tried to adapt older properties. I'm thinking immediately off the top of my head, Ender's Game, Mm. The Giver, Mm. Childhood's End, Mm. all of which veered away very strongly from the source material, but most importantly didn't think about the times in which that source material was written and why it was important in all these different ways. Except, in a sense, I think both The Giver and Mm -hmm. Ender's Game, what Mm -hmm. they decided was we can't evoke the context in which these books were written, so we're going to update them to engage with current history and Mm -hmm. current social norms. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't have the same meaning in that context as they did in their original. And I think when a child of 10 or 12, in my case, picks up Ender's Game and reads it, we pick up on the context from clues. We understand instinctively as children or as adults that the world which led to the creation of Ender's Game is not the world that exists today. And when we talk about Ender's Game we have the added complication of the fact that since the book was written, 
And since a sequel to Speaker for the Dead was written, which is perhaps one of the most beautiful science fiction books ever written, the author has made himself a nuisance to humanity. <laughs> yeah. And Hashtag nuisance to humanity. <laughs> So that's like deeply problematic when you have an author who wrote a book that was entirely centered on compassion and empathy and understanding people who are not like you, who then hits the airwaves as a huge homophobe yep. again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I believe it measurably impacted ticket sales yeah. to his movie. So yeah. people haven't watched the movie because they knew about him. Yes. And that's that's like... When your life as an author intrudes upon your book's reception in yes. that specific way, yep. um, yeah, it's never going to recover from there. Yep. So I wanted to talk about a couple books. I actually want to derail this a little tiny bit Go to talk it. about books that either have been adapted yeah. um, or are in the progress of ad adaptation. So uh -huh. I'm going to uh -huh. talk about briefly one of my favorite film adaptations of a science fiction novel of all time, mm -hmm. which is Cloud Atlas. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to talk about Margaret Atwood. She has two series currently in production that will be released, I believe, over the next year, one to Hulu and one to Netflix, and that's Alias Grace and The Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about uh, the cinematic in these particular contexts. So a lot of people do not like the Cloud Atlas film mm -hmm. adaptation. Do you know any of these people? Uh, I know they exist. I, yeah, I too know that they exist, and I want to honor you, because I understand that when you read a book before you see a movie that takes a very different angle on the book, that problems will ensue. Yeah. I was in the fortunate position of seeing the movie first. Me too. I did not read the book first. Yeah. And I think that this has led to my current preferred mode of receiving new science fiction, which is mm -hmm. to read the book after seeing the movie, mm -hmm. because then I am able to see them as two separate entities and yes. analyze them that way. Yeah. Whereas if I walk into a movie theater having read a book that I really care deeply about, and it's not adapted like in a way that is representational of my vision of the book, yeah. and then I am, I, you know, I'm, I'm just so disappointed. Yes. And 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 that yeah. that could I True. could see how that could happen with Cloud Atlas. It did not for me because I saw the movie first, and the movie is a beautiful piece of cinema. I think that the ways in which they evoked some of the structural components of Cloud Atlas, the book version, uh, were really imaginative, using makeup and um, special effects in order to create continuity between characters who otherwise are disconnected structurally was really fascinating. And it created through lines that wouldn't have existed otherwise when you're cutting between, is it six Different continuities. I think it's more than that. I thought it was like seven or eight. There's they could, no, it's six. It's I, think you're, six. I think it's six. So yeah, there yeah, are yeah. six stories oh. happening simultaneously in the film, and that's the only way to get through them without making it feel like mini movie one, right. mini movie two, right. mini movie three. Which the book, when you have it divided that way, it reads fine. Yeah. Um, and the book itself is actually structured using um, a biblical, an Old Testament biblical structure mm -hmm. where you have a divot in the middle. And everything gets chopped off roughly in the middle of one story. And then the next story begins, and it gets cut off in the middle of the story. And the next story begins and gets cut off in the middle of the story. And only the central story is continued start to finish. And then the fifth story picks up and ends. Then the fourth story picks up and ends. Then the third, so on and so forth. This creates structurally a V shape. And at the bottom of the V is the most important story upon which hinges a lot of the plot devices in which you are taught as a reader um, why the structure exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it crystallizes a lot of the interesting work that's being done by David Mitchell. Yeah. Fascinating. Doesn't work in a movie. So I think what <laughs> the movie did was actually really brilliant. Yes. I don't think that it looked at the cinematic elements yes. of Cloud Alice, the book, mm -hmm. and said, not interested. There was enough material out there that was cinematic that adapted well to the corporate cinema experience yep. that they were able to create something that really did honor the original text. Mm -hmm. And it possibly also helps, and this is my question mark for you, Tony. Mm -hmm. I think it helps that this was a recent publication. Yeah. Because I yeah. think when a book is new and you have 
all of the immediate response to the book from the public out there on the internet for editors and yeah. publishers and readers and I, you know, all of this materials out there to draw upon as a, a film or television producer. Mm -hmm. I think it helps you find what's important to pull mm -hmm. into a cinematic version mm -hmm. whereas something that was maybe published in the golden age or maybe even the dispossessed in yeah. the 70s. Uh -huh. A lot of the initial reactions took place mm -hmm. outside of the internet, mm -hmm. of course, because mm -hmm. the internet didn't exist as it does yes. today. That's my theory, but I, I wanted to get to my next book, but you have a question. Yeah, that's super important to note because one of the <laughs> big, big things that I wanted to bring up here, specific to science fiction on television, is that when we think of sci-fi now and, you know, any time in the past got almost 25 years now, like, it's just sort of accepted that we can have things like storyline continuity and basically a book over a season or over a series mm -hmm. or something like we can do a novel on television and i really want to point to babylon 5 as <laughs> the series that you always want to i know point to i always babylon want to point 5. to babylon 5 but i want to point to that specifically as a series that that sort of pioneered that for science fiction at least and what a science fiction novel on television i forget what the term was exactly that J. Michael Straczynski used for it, but I think it was something like that. That you could tell, basically, an involved story that counted on every prior episode to build towards the current episode and the ongoing story and the ongoing character arcs, and things didn't get reset, and things made sense and had to continue making sense because everything was adding together, and you didn't really see that before. Like, I'm thinking even of... Like, the change you saw in the Star Trek series between, like, Next Generation mm. and Deep Space Nine, and, like, you went back on a, on Voyager, and I don't want to get a lot into Star Trek now, but mm. I think that not taking that for granted is a big thing, but the reason why I wanted to mention that now is that Babylon 5 was really around at the beginning of the internet, when people mm. were investing in it, where, when fans were investing in it, not just by going to, like, cons and getting together and, like... But, <laughs> but the fact that people were on the internet using, you know, the, the tools that were at their disposals mm. in the mid-90s to talk about the show and get invested in it and form this fan community was, I think, as unprecedented as the show itself in terms of what it did for I think it was one of the possibility. The defining events of the internet was that people derailed it yes. from being a military application yes. used to communicate formally with each other yeah. to communicating very informally with complete yeah. strangers about your, your fan interests. Yep. Yep. I think that this transformed in the early 90s the potential of the internet from what it could have been to what it is. Right. Which, I mean, the internet is where we go for knee-jerk reactions today. Yep. It wouldn't have been originally. No. We had zines for that. Yeah. We had, like, right. book clubs for yep. that. Yep. Nobody goes to book clubs anymore. I can say this with authority as a librarian. It is <laughs> not common for book clubs to be a success <laughs> these days in the way that they used to be, mm -hmm. because they used to be the primary mode of engagement with like things that you loved. The, the second book I wanted to mention. Yes, let's talk about and it I did, I did mention it, actually. <laughs> now I'm going to talk about it. Is Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. Alias Grace is interesting. I think what it's going to do is between Alias Grace and Handmaid's Tale adaptations, we're going to have an interesting thought experiment to explore my question of mm -hmm. whether timeliness of the publication is important or timeliness mm -hmm. of the of the social structures portrayed within it. Because yeah. in the case of The Handmaid's Tale, what we have is a world that has reverted mm -hmm. to the world that existed around her writing this book originally. So... Obviously, we have seen some progress in our world. Gay marriage is now, like, legal. Um, but there are things that we <laughs> seem to be kind of going backwards on. And I'm not going to name names, but Donald Trump <laughs> <laughs> and Mike Pence. God damn it! I named names. They have taken us back to the Stone Age on some very important issues. Specifically, women's rights to their own bodies. And that is the central core conversation of yeah. A Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. And so I think what's going to be interesting is The Handmaid's Tale, right now when you reread it, feels very current. In fact, there's a lot of internet chatter out there right now. People are tweeting at Margaret Atwood at a rate they haven't for like at least a decade. 
<laughs> about, oh my goodness, have you seen the latest debate? That is totally a page out of Margaret Atwood's A Handmaid's Tale. Hashtag, yeah. look at me. Um, and so, like, this this is something that's happening. I think that the, the conversations that happen with Deep Space Nine, or, um, is that the one you're talking about? That one five. Yes. The thing... <laughs> I know my sci-fi, right? <laughs> the things that... And then the internet fans <laughs> eviscerated her. Stop. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I drink, I drink spike egg dog, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a cold. I will blame it on everything. <laughs> Babylon 5 was happening as the internet came into being. Yes. Uh, the Handmaid's Tale was written, I believe, before that. I think it was 80s, wasn't it? It was, it was... I'm going to find this out, man. Anyway, Here, what, what's, what's great about it is that it's... You know, it's... The conversation is current and in again it's current again <laughs> in that the original conversation lagged you know you know it was it came out it was groundbreaking everyone loved it or some people who were usually male did not love it um but then that you know the fervor died down now it has been decided by the powers that be that this is actually corporate cinematic material so you're seeing a spike in interest again but on top of that, you're seeing people bringing it up completely unrelated to its adaptation. And mm-hmm. I think that that greater conversation happening around this book gives The Handmaid's Tale adaptation, which we are soon to see on Hulu, a chance that Alias Grace may not. Because I don't know of anyone who's really talking at large about Alias Grace in the way that they are about The Handmaid's Tale. Because I don't think it has been made important again in the same way that Donald Trump and Mike Pence have indirectly made The Handmaid's Tale. So I think that it'll be very interesting to see these particular series adapted. I do love that Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and YouTube, actually, Mm -hmm. are making um, multi-part serials um, that provide new possibilities for what can be defined as corporate cinematic material. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think that The Handmaid's Tale sits on top of a wall somewhere and describes the scenery in a way that is traditionally Mm -hmm. cinematic. I don't think this is traditional cinematic material. Um, From my long time past reading of Alias Grace, Mm -hmm. I think it had maybe a touch more. But I think that what we see here are two books Mm -hmm. that could go very, very wrong. Mm -hmm. Cloud Atlas was a book that went right. Do you have any other books on your list of, of, of books that might kind of cast light on what's cinematic and what's not? Yeah, so I was thinking, uh, Handmaid's Tale was 86, by the way. 86? Uh, yeah. Uh, which, it is 30 years old. Congratulations. It is, yes. Um, but while you were saying that, I was thinking about um, corporate acceptance of what can be cinematic and what cannot be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that the model that we have now where there are multiple streaming services, there are more channels than ever, um, indie movies, uh, and, and indie science fiction, I should say. Um, there's a movie with Anne, H- Anne Hathaway, I think it's Anne Hathaway, who like controls the movements of a, of a giant monster in Tokyo as she's like standing in a playground. This sounds crazy, but believe me, something oh like God. this exists. Well, if it's Anne Hathaway... And robots. I'm there. I want to say it's Anne Hathaway. Oh my god, anyway, that's the sexiest thing um, I've heard all day. <laughs> word. Um, <laughs> but what I wanted to say based on that is uh, two examples of books that are that could very easily be cinematic, I think, but don't they don't jump like through the, the broadcast of television model? Because I think mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. it's worth noting, just yes. hashtag interjection, <laughs> that the corporate model is simultaneously narrowing its focus yeah. and diversifying. Yes. So network and broadcast television and even cable television mm-hmm. are really narrowing what they think is possible to adapt. So you're seeing a lot of television series scripts being bogged down in development hell for forever, far more than in the past. Now part of that might be that there are more books written. Um, but I think there are a lot more books that are not making it into adaptation to television series movies are basically stuck in reboots and series. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is like generally accepted as true. There's very few original screenplays for, for science fiction films being pushed out of de- development hell and into production. And also at the same time, you're seeing streaming services 
you know, they're they're finding ways to narrow their focus as well. Amazon yeah. Prime has their premiere season where you can view the first episode that's made kind of like a standalone movie. You vote on which ones you like, and then only the ones that have interest go forward. I think that's pretty innovative, but at the same time, that does create certain new challenges for, yes. for moving forward with adaptations. So, introduction over. I yeah. just think it's worth noting. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a good note. So the two books that I want to think about that fall outside of that are Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower Boom! and Connie Willis's To Say Nothing of the Dog. <laughs> and I mentioned both of these, and they're sort of, they're difficult books to pick out. The Parable of the Sower is followed by a sequel, which is important. Um, to Say Nothing of the Dog is part of a, not really a series, but a similar concept series. That Tell has us a little bit more about five that books. one. To Say Nothing of the Dog, it shares some characters with the rest of the books in its series. I'm doing air quotes here. <laughs> series. He is. Um, but the essential conceit of this series is that you have time travelers, historians, <laughs> who study history by actually going back in time and experiencing it. And it's called the Oxford Time Travel Series because you follow a series of historical researchers from Oxford who get entangled in historical shenanigans. And uh, important question. Yes. Is this Wishbone with people? Yes. Okay. It is. And what's interesting about this series is that each of the books in it is very tonally different. The Doomsday Book is just existentially crushing. Like, it's 800 pages of, dear God, why, why does the world exist? But I chose to say nothing of the dog because it's hilarious. It is fun and it's ridiculous and it relies on wordplay and situational comedy. And I chose it because time travel comedy is absolutely something that's been made in the past 10 years and made successfully. And maybe a Connie Willis book would not be adapted <laughs> into like a frat guy time travel <laughs> comedy. But at the same time, I Hot think there's time definitely... Machine. Is that what you're thinking? Hot I'm, time I haven't seen it, but that's, oh that's sort of what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a book that would have some staying power because Connie Willis is an awesome writer, mm. and this could be adapted in a really funny way. And, like, especially if you were to take the Downton Abbey crowd, of which I am a member, like the period piece folks. Woo! Like, this is basically a period piece made funny with time travel. That's amazing. And uh, Matthew Crawley, am I right? <laughs> and that could absolutely be a successful thing. And yet, no Connie Willis book ever has ever been adapted in any form. Same thing Do for... Do you know why? Do you know why? I'm, I'm going to speculate, but please tell me what you're thinking. I think because funny is mm. really hard. Mm. And we're going to talk about another funny book that was adapted and has some question marks on it. Yes. Um, you will be familiar with it. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Douglas Adams. Yes, yes. Continue. Um, so, in the obverse of To Say Nothing of the Dog, Parable of the Sower oh. by Octavia Butler. I love her so much. Is a book that is... It, totally similar to if you read uh, The Road by Cormac McCarthy, I don't know. it's it doesn't hit a lot of the same notes, but I think that <laughs> it would if if you were trying to adapt this movie like the elevator pitch for Parable of the Sower could invoke the road in some way can or you imagine, apocalyptic. Can you imagine the elevator pitch for another of her books, which I love, Lola Sprue? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. okay, so. <laughs> I have problems with Lilith Sprood on the matter of consent, which we talked about last podcast mm -hmm. about Lena New Moon. But Octavia Butler does really interesting, serious work. Yes. I think. Yes. Yes, she does. And the reason why I wanted to choose her is that Octavia Butler is so wicked smart, oh, wickedly God, smart, and she refuses to be silent. She refused to be silent about racial things, oh, about yeah. ethnic mm -hmm. things, about sexual things. Like, she is someone who... Ugh, God, I can't, I, can't even, I can't even have the words because I, I like Octavia Butler She's so much. She's doing the but, little thing where your hands become, like, shaking little maracas. Yes. Because yes. you're so in love with the thing. Yes. So, the reason why this book is so wonderful and so difficult to read is that Octavia Butler does not look away from anything, and she does not let you look away from anything, either. <laughs> And I think that's one of the reasons why this book has not been adapted. Why none of Octavia Butler's books have been adapted. Because they're cinematic. They would be successful either as 
movies or as television series. And I think that the, the parables could be successful television series. But the problem with it is, and I'm going to go back to Game of Thrones again, like, because, <laughs> no. because we so, see so much problematic sexual violence ah. on Game of Thrones, oh, and they present it in this way that doesn't find it problematic. If it's we because were, it's historically accurate. Right. The, the, his, the history of Westeros, clearly. Because um, because dragons <laughs> don't make something not historically accurate. We're right. still living in the Middle Ages. Exactly. We still need to show the oppression of women and not comment on it at <laughs> all. Yes, yes. Which, if you were to adapt the parable books, if you were to adapt any of Octavia Butler's books, you could not do. There would be no adaptation without the conversations that are part of those books about the oppression of racial minorities, mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. the oppression of ethnic minorities, mm-hmm. about the violence visited on racial and ethnic minorities mm-hmm. and women, and mm-hmm. the aggressive violence, mm-hmm. and the pervasive shit, the pervasive, <laughs> the pervasive shit, shit. That, is, that is attendant to uh, the things that she's fictionalizing, but is also looking at very, very uh, truthfully and honestly. If you have a colonic disorder, we really apologize because I'm sure pervasive shit is something they are actually familiar with. (laughs) Hashtag pervasive shit in many (laughs) different ways. But I mentioned both of these books because they are definitely not similar tonally, but they're also both part of canons of work from women who have not been adapted Mm. ever on television or in the movies but who definitely have written books that are totally cinematic, could totally hold your attention Mm -hmm. in the way that a lot of science fiction that does exist and has existed can do and could do it better with, you know, the right adaptation. Obviously, I'm thinking thinking here of a book, and a book is a very different media property Mm -hmm. than a movie or a television Mm -hmm. show. So it would take a whole lot of work on the part of the creative team involved. So I don't mean to say that thinking of a book and what I visualize as the movie or the television show would obviously be superior to all the science fiction that exists. Of course. Even though that is what I just said, but I'm acknowledging that it's more complicated than that. Tastemaker Tony strikes again. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Let's talk about a movie that has been made as an adaptation of a very famous book that we both love very much and have deep feelings about. Yes. We are talking about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes. Now, this is a movie (laughs) that I should note I required back when I was teaching college freshman comp. (laughs) I required my students to read, and then we watched the movie. (laughs) I didn't realize that. After, after, like, one of our manuscripts were handed in, Mm -hmm. so there wasn't much we could do until the feedback had been received. So we did do the book-to-movie adaptation Mm -hmm. sort of comparison, Mm -hmm. but you're talking about freshman comp, and I (laughs) want to hear what you think, Tony. Do you think that, I think it was like 2005 or something, that the, yeah, right. <laughs> the film uh-huh. starring <laughs> Bill Bogagan <laughs> was a success? I actually, I, I don't know what kind of responses this is going to provoke, but I actually really liked the movie. Can you tell me why? Yes. I thought that it managed to keep the spirit of the book intact while adding in a lot of new elements. Physical comedy was actually pretty good. I'm thinking of the fly swatter to the face scene. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Right. And I'm thinking of, like, you know, the things that you couldn't necessarily do in the book. Like, it would be really difficult to take The Hitchhiker's Guide or any of the books in that series and adapt them into any other medium and capture the really, really complex wordplay that Douglas Adams did with the prose. And I'm not thinking just of the dialogue here, but what he actually did in toto on the page um, and well, what and it, I think we should note it was actually a radio play first. Right, it was a radio play. It's been adapted in multiple different ways, and I think it was a stage play, too, not just radio play. Oh, yeah, play. yeah, it's been everything. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know it was You're at least on one everything. sort of play. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> well, we're giving up. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that part of that was that Douglas Adams has been involved up through, unfortunately, <clears throat> his death, in, unfortunately. In, in, in every adaptation of The Hitchhiker's Guide. So he was there to sort of like shepherd it into a new medium and think about how this could be a successful adaptation and keep the humor intact while moving to a completely different form of humor. Like, what can you do in a dialogue-driven radio play that you couldn't do in a book? What can you do in a visually driven movie that you couldn't do in a radio play or a book. Dolphins. And I, I, totally. <laughs> and I think it was really successful in 
adapting humor in the way that no other medium could do, but still staying relatively faithful to the core message and the core humor of the book. Because, like, I, I have an interesting feeling about The Hitchhiker's Guide, that cinematic isn't necessarily the right word to, like, apply to it. No. Even though it, I has, it has found a home in cinema that's yes. very successful in my mind. I think that it's it's just adaptable across all mediums in yes. a way that a lot of science fiction really isn't. Yes. I was thinking about, um, you know, talking about uh, the seriousness of Ursula K. Le Guin, mm -hmm. the, you know, the humor of Connie Willis. Like, yeah. there are certain things that don't translate very well mm -hmm. to the big screen, but somehow Douglas Adams hit the formula mm -hmm. that translates everywhere. Yeah. Like, it translates yes. to memes on <sighs> Tumblr, it translates to audio, it translates to the audio book, as yeah. well as the stage play, as well as the radio play. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it, it was so good in every form. Mm -hmm. And part of that might have been the cohesiveness of its author's vision. Yes. But I think a part of that is something inherent to the text itself, where, like, humor, um, really sharply written humor, yeah. is, in a sense, a universal mm -hmm. backbone for whatever mm -hmm. form. Um, I don't think that the humor of Connie Willis will be the universal kind of humor. I have yet to read her. That's on my list. I think we have time to mention, briefly, yes. two more books. Yes. Do you want to pick one last book while I talk about my last book? Yes, absolutely. So, one of the things, as you will know if you've listened to the podcast now, <laughs> is that I'm a big Star Trek fan, and I yes. have been for a while. That does not mean <laughs> that I think that Star Trek is without its faults. We can gladly and gleefully talk gleefully. about uh, Star Trek and uh, the the necessary critiques of Star Trek that have existed, that should <laughs> exist. With that said, I, I or rather, I mentioned that because the last book series, not specific book, but last book series that I want to talk about is Ian M. Banks's Culture series. Ah. And I mentioned this because <laughs> I think that culture does a lot of things that Star Trek has successfully and unsuccessfully done over the years in terms of illustrating this utopian society in which no one wants for anything and, you know, how do they take up their time, what, what happens when they, you know, get embroiled in wars with other people, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, and I think, mm -hmm, having yeah. just read the first book in the Culture series, which mm -hmm. is considered... Flebus? 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 That's how I say it. Consider uh -huh. Flebus. Um, I think that our conversation coming full circle back to The Expanse. Yes. I think yes. the way Banks structures his book, the way that Banks characterizes his characters, yep. and the way he, stealing from Ken Stanley Robinson, does mm -hmm. have the occasional moment where he breaks out and describes a scene. Yep. I think it's the perfect recipe for... Yep. A series mm -hmm. on the scale of The Expanse, which yeah. I'm very excited to say has been renewed for a second season. Mm -hmm. So I think that it might even be better yeah. than The Expanse in mm -hmm. terms of material. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious why you think it hasn't been adapted yet. Because the first book came out when? Oh, Lord. I want to say 80s again. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact year. It feels but, very current. But p part of the reason why I think that culture has not been adapted is that there is no continuity between books other than, like, core concepts to the series, like the culture itself, the fact that there are mines and drones and the background of the cultural, cu the culture Idiran War, which you see in Consider Flebus, but in the past in every other book. And I think that the problem here was that it wasn't, it wasn't a series. Oh, yeah, okay, so uh, in 87 is how long culture's been around. Th that there was no way in which culture could be easily adapted because it spans so many different plots, so many different characters, and yet now seeing within the past, I want to say five years, I don't think it existed beyond five to ten years ago, let's say, but where you have these anthology TV series where every series um, or every season of a series is new cast, ah, new are we thinking like location. Halt and Catch Fire here kind of a thing? I am not familiar with that. But it's, about the, it's about the evolution of the PC. You would love oh, it so much. Cool, cool. Um, then yes, probably something like that. <laughs> but but the culture would have to be something like that, where every different season is a new set of characters, a new location, new plot, etc. American et Horror Story would be the go-to descriptor, right? I think that's right. Okay. I, I haven't seen it, but I've read about okay. it. Um, so, 
you know, the fact that we haven't had that out there makes me think that that's been a barrier. The fact that culture deals with characters who are drones, who are mines, with big, really complicated environments that would require a lot of computer graphics, or, you know, if we're talking 80s and 90s, a lot of miniatures, a lot of models, I think it would have been prohibitively expensive as well. But if we wanted to adapt it, now the ways exist, and the templates exist, and the precedents exist for culture to be made into a really successful television series, I think. Uh, and I would like to see it out there, because as far as optimistic visions of humanity, and by that I mean where we get to in the culture, that there is this utopia where people can afford to be bored and devote their lives to pleasure, is something that we don't really have outside of Star Trek. There is no optimism. There's only mm. dystopia and apocalypse at this point. And I think that in some ways that's also a barrier to culture being adapted now, because it's just going against the times. But honestly, I think that's one of the reasons why we need culture the most. Because it, it takes a good hard look at people in that utopian situation, and it, it, it doesn't allow them to rest. It says, what do these people do? How do they spend their time? What is that utopia actually like? And it's much more complicated than that. But it's a really interesting conversation. And I feel like we're missing out on a lot by not having cultural yeah. access to something better. I think, and I think too, that the discussion about culture series, it doesn't end today. We will come back to culture at some point yes, we will. in the future. I feel unable to talk about the whole series because I've only read one book. However, I do think that that one book offered so much meat to chew mm -hmm. that actually this might be a good place to end the podcast today with the note that the yeah. book that I would have mentioned is actually a two-parter by Mary Doria Russell and it's The Sparrow and Children of God um, unlike culture where there's no continuity between books this is really part one and part two of the same story there's no discontinuity between mm -hmm. the two books and this is a series where um, SETI teams up with the, which which is it's the which branch of the it's church the is Jesuits, it? Isn't it's the it? Jesuit branch of the Catholic yeah. Church, with the premise that who are the people who are going to be most invested on in making first contact when we know that there's um, another alien species out there that we can't access by radio signals, and the natural answer to anyone who's a person of faith is actually mm -hmm. the missionaries. <laughs> so it's a really interesting exploration. It gives you a lot of background into the Jesuits mm -hmm. that I knew nothing about until I read the book. Mm -hmm. And then I started Googling and spending a little bit more time learning about the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. And it also provided some really fantastic information about SETI. And so, like, both of these are bodies of people who independently have, you know, very different goals. Mm -hmm. But in the pursuit of making first contact, share a lot. And so they do team up. And it's a very, it's a very interesting series because the yeah. first book is like extremely compassionate. Mm -hmm. These people who you wouldn't expect to work together work together. Mm -hmm. um, and then the and then the second book is kind of like, uh oh, now we're on another planet and it's never going to work out, man. And so I think if I was to give a thirty second pitch for a book series to be adapted, mm -hmm. either for the big screen or the small screen, it would be The Sparrow. The problem is, and this is why I wanted to end with The Sparrow. The problem is, is that not every book is destined to be on the screen, yeah. in part because authors have a very realistic idea about whether it's going to hold true or not during mm -hmm. their lifetime. And Mary Doria Russell has gone on record to say that she never wants anyone to adapt mm -hmm. <laughs> her books to movies mm -hmm. or television series, even though they were optioned by Brad Pitt back before he was even Brangelina. So <laughs> I just wanted to say, while we have these great desires to see something adapted. There's so much meat there to chew in terms of like portraying the the saga of the church's involvement in this, the saga, because this is like multi-generational, by the way, um, the saga of SETI's involvement and what actually unfolds on the, the surface of the planet that they go to visit. You know, I think that there's so much that is cinematic there and we're never going to see it. It's corporate yeah. cinematic, it is literarily cinematic, and I think we've probably confused the hell out of you guys who are probably. listening to us about the distinction between the two, but I feel, after having looked at all these books, mm -hmm. well, actually not all of them, we actually left quite a few untouched. We did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> looking at some of these books, um, I think that that distinction is actually clearer in my mind. 
Yeah. So thank you, Tony, for being willing to speak with me for 51 minutes about <laughs> cinematic quality. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to, if you're listening to us, hash through what cinematic means. Yeah, uh, you are willing. You're welcome. We are willing and eager to see you respond to our podcasts on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on our website. So please stop in. Uh, if you're not already subscribers, uh, please consider hitting that button that makes you a subscriber. It really helps us kind of gauge our, you know, whether we're complete, utter failures at life or not. So I wouldn't, I, I don't think the stakes are that high, but we appreciate the stakes follow. Stakes are so high. <laughs> All right, so follow us online and check back in next time for another podcast on the Imaginaries. What will we, what will we be talking about next time? Uh, let's go ahead and say we're going to talk about Dark Eden, a novel by Chris Beckett, and also a little bit of the sequel, Mother of Eden. Okay, I'm very excited to talk about that. Thank you, Tony. All right, see you later.